can tell us about dark matter or other fundamental fields that may not even be a significant fraction of dark matter. But before we start, let me finish what I was saying um, about the, uh, the puzzle that we have. Okay, It's still a puzzle. I have no idea what's going on here. But if you remember, we basically showed that if you have a, an object which is extremely compact, then the intermediate signal must be dominated by, uh, by the photosphere, so the photosphere modes, which are the vacuole quasi normal modes. Okay? So if you throw something into a, um, a very compact object, the signal would look something like this. And it has to be exactly the same as a signal coming from a black hole, okay? It, we, we are not allowed to tell the difference up until times when, the, when the, the gravitational wave has had time to reach the surface of the object, okay? So from this critical point, lying somewhere there, onwards, then the object may respond and we might see imprints of the surface, okay? Now, the, the, the puzzle is the following. If you change the boundary conditions of your problem, like for instance, uh, instead of a black hole, now I have a star, the star has some surface, and you are imposing boundary conditions not at the horizon, but either at the surface or regularity at the origin. So they change completely, okay? And because the boundary conditions change completely, the quasi-normal frequencies of this, of this object, by the way, this object has a surface at the horizon radius plus an epsilon, okay? So it's not a black hole, very close to being a black hole. Boundary conditions completely different, mode structure completely different, okay? You can check that with the notebook I sent you once again. Uh, as an example, if, well, let me remind you that for a black hole, uh, BH, these numbers here look something like 0 0.374 minus 0 0.0899, okay? This is the lowest mode. For a star whose surface lies at, with an epsilon, say, 10 to minus 6, these numbers change into, uh, I'm making up, okay, making something up. 0 0.2 minus 10 to minus 6 i. Actually, this is a number that came up in simulations. So the paradox is, if I, if I look at this sine wave, exponentially damped sine wave, these numbers match these frequencies, both for the black hole and for the compact object, right? So what's happening? Where in the spectral information of my PDs is this, or is this actually? You see, if I have a compact object, this number is not there in the mode spectrum, but it is in the time domain waveform. It's this one, right? So what's going on? Half of the, of the answer, we know it. So let me show you the simple del delta function that we solved for. So this, we had this delta function potential, and we evolved with initial data at x naught, okay? And if you remember, the, the, um, the frequency was minus v naught over 2, i, okay? So if you evolve this, this uh, problem in time, you get something like this, okay? So you get, uh, so this initial condition is some Gaussian. This is not, uh, kind of funny, okay? So you see all of the, so these are the first two echoes. First signal, I'm sitting somewhere to your right, okay, very far away. First signal, then an echo, second echo, and here I have like 100 echoes, okay? And what you see is the signal itself decays, so this is fit to this value, which is, so V naught was one half, so omega should be one fourth minus one-fourth of i, okay? It matches very nicely the way the pulse, the individual pulse, decays with time, okay? Good? So this is the, the analog of the black hole quasi-normal mode, okay? But then you see at late times, 
it sets in to a new behavior. So this number here, uh, 0 0.144 minus 0 blah, 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 is the quasi-normal mode of the composite system. Because you see now, I put a barrier here. Without the barrier, it's a black hole system. We did everything we, we had to do. Now I'm placing a barrier here, and I'm going to get echoes, right? So the very late time behavior, sorry, this guy is governed by the quasi-normal modes of the, of the full system. This is fine. And it agrees with this. The problem is, well, the puzzle. The puzzle is, where exactly is this information? I have absolutely no idea. OK? <laughs> so I have nothing else to add to this problem. But it's an interesting open problem. There must be a, a tool, a, a tool in spectral analysis that tells you, well, this, you had to find this. OK? And actually, sorry, I was going to forget. You, you, actually, this problem, this echo business, didn't start with trying to find alternatives to black holes. It started by trying to understand how black holes in the galaxy respond. Okay? And yesterday, I was telling you that we did this experiment where we placed a black hole inside a shell. And as the shell was made larger and larger, the modes of the system became more and more different from that of an isolated black hole. Exactly the same thing happens. If you do a time domain waveform, you see something like this. So the, 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 the modes which become so different are actually only the late time behavior of the signal. The early time response is exactly the same as that of a single black hole with nothing around it, right? So if you place a, a galaxy and too many stars around the black hole, you're going to see echoes caused by the reflection of the ring down waves generated at the photosphere and interacting with the star, with the star's gravitational field. Okay? Very good. But today I'd like to discuss, well, now I'd like to discuss a new phenomena or another phenomena connected to black holes that instead of telling you about the structure, the near horizon structure of, of these guys, is going to tell you about the uh, not so near horizon uh, structure, but about the ergo region, so negative energy states. This phenomenon is known as superradiance. It's not new or unique to black holes, okay? Actually, we knew about superradiance decades ago. The first example I know of is this. It was done, it was, it's an example taken from fluid dynamics. It was worked out in 57, and Landau and Lifshitz have half a page on this, which means two days of work. <laughs> so the example is the following. You take two fluids, OK, this lower half plane, suppose it's water, and the upper half plane, this guy here, is air, OK, like ocean and air. And the air is moving with respect to the ocean, OK? Now, a fish in the ocean is doing an experiment. The fish is going to send a, so a sound wave towards the interface, OK? And then it's going to record how much, of that sound of how much of the amplitude of that wave is reflected back, OK? Now, if you do the calculation, which is not that tough, but I mean, it does require attention to details, you will find, well, the fish will find that the amplitude of the reflected wave, so no change in frequency, the amplitude of the reflected wave is larger than the amplitude of the wave is sent in when the relative velocity is larger than the local speed of sound. Okay? So if this interface is moving supersonically, the sound wave is extracting energy away from the motion. And that's, of course, how the fish gets energy back. This is a kind of Cherenkov effect, if you wish. And in fact, you could, you know, uh, you could place a bunch of phenomena under this superradiance category. Uh, I'm not going to be discussing translational. This is a translational kind of thing, OK? I'm going to discuss spinning black holes. So for that, I need another related phenomena, which is rotational superradiance. And there's one example that we, we are very familiar with that looks like rotational superradiance. And that's the Earth-Moon system. Okay, 
there's really no wave involved, but if you pay attention to, the, uh, to the what's happening, you'll realize immediately that it has to be very generic. Now, in the Earth-Moon system, well, it could, it could be the Earth-Sun, but let me focus on the Earth-Moon, okay? The Moon, so this explanation, by the way, was given by the Sun of Darwin, so the first explanation for tides. So you have the, the Earth, it, spin, it spins around its axis once every 24 hours, okay? The Moon is going around the Earth once every roughly 28 days. So during one day, basically, the Moon is standing still, okay? So I'll admit that. Now, the Earth has oceans uh, around it, and the, the Moon is basically pulling tides on it, right? And you see the tides look something like this. I'm, of course, exaggerating everything and so on. But because everything would be nice and smooth, if there was nothing, no friction or nothing, the, uh, the tide Earth axis would basically point towards the Earth-Moon axis, right? They would be everything would be aligned. Be but because there's friction between the crust and the oceans, there's a very small angle. Darwin called it the, the tidal angle, phi, between Earth-Moon and Earth tides. Okay? Very small, 10 to minus 6, whatever. Okay? So what is this doing exactly? Well, first, because there's friction, the day has to be getting longer. Okay? Right? As years go by. This is kind of trivial. What's not so trivial is, well, but if the day is getting longer, the Earth is slowing down, of course. But where the heck is the angular momentum going? It's an isolated system. It has to conserve angular momentum. Well, the angular momentum is going to the moon. So there's a transferal of angular momentum actually caused by this lump of ocean that causes the moon to gain angular momentum. If you do the calculation, it's half a line. It means that the moon is getting farther away from the Earth. This has been measured, okay? People put mirrors on the moon, they throw lasers in, and they measure. It's two centimeters a year or so. It's getting farther. When will the process stop? It has to stop someday. By the way, does anybody know when will the process stop? <laughs> it's my last lecture. I need to venture. <laughs> well, it started because it started because the Earth is spinning very fast, right? So it will stop when the day of the Earth is equal to the rotation period of the Moon, right? then there's no tidal angles, there's no nothing, everything is aligned. So if the Earth has always the same face towards the Moon, that's it. And now you can think, oh, wait a minute, is this why the Moon has the same face towards the Earth? It is. So this process was active on the Moon millions of years ago. Actually, there's a nice book uh, called The Cosmic Stories or by Calvino, on, on this issue. So many millions of years back, the moon was much closer to the Earth. People could go. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah. But anyway, so now you, you, can, you kind of understand that this should happen for any spinning object. You see, this is really just friction. The universe doesn't really like relative motion, right? So everything needs to be synchronized somehow. So the question is, does this happen for black hole spacetimes or any other spacetime or not? Actually, does it happen if I place a cylinder here and I spin it, does this happen? And the answer is yes, it does. If you put a cylinder rotating here and you throw sound waves at the cylinder, as long as there's a coupling between the cylinder and the sound wave, superradiance must occur. This was measured last year. It's, it was not a cylinder, it was what people called an acoustic dumb hole. It's basically a version of a, a black hole in water. Okay? So let me show you that it, it has to happen even if you have a black hole. Very good. So I'm repeating the same uh, story. I'm taking a very simple field content, just a massive scalar field. You remember we basically separated and decoupled this equation in Schwarzschild. It was very simple because there's spherical symmetry, so you could expand in spherical harmonics. You do exactly the same thing here, 
And you will find, well, the background is not spherically symmetric, so you need to be a bit more refined. But separation of variables work. So if you try these sunsets, if you try phi equals some radial function times some angular function and oops, an harmonic time dependence. So theta and phi are the angular variables. So theta as you move for phi. Okay? Then you will find the following. You can separate variables. You get two uh, coupled equations, one for the radial wave function r, another for the angular function capital theta. They look something like this. The, so I'm doing this in Kerr, Kerr space time, okay? Delta ddr of r plus k squared over delta. I'll tell you what these numbers are. Minus a tilde, minus a was the spin of the black hole. Omega is this frequency of the wave, plus 2m am omega r equals zero. So you see, this is fine. I really got a decoupled uh, equation for r, uh, separated. And for the angular part, one over sine of theta, dd theta of sine of theta, dd theta of this capital theta, plus a squared omega squared <coughs> cosine squared of theta, minus m squared over cosine squared of theta, sorry, sine squared, plus a, capital theta equals zero, okay? m is the azimuthal number, this guy here, omega is this frequency, this quantity k is r squared plus a squared omega minus am, a tilde is a separation constant, and it's a plus the mass r squared. And delta is in the metric, the background metric, okay? It defines the, the horizon. It's this guy. Okay? So everything now is in terms of spin and black hole mass. And you will notice that the only thing you don't know is the separation constant A. Okay? Right? Of course you do, so by the way, if omega is zero, this really is just a Legendre equation. So solutions are spherical harmonics, okay? When A is not zero, this is called a spin-weighted spherical harmonic, actually a spin zero spherical harmonic. Spheroidal harmonic, sorry. In the general case, of course, you find the separation constant just requiring regularity of the angular function at zero and pi. Okay? Yeah. Sorry, sorry? Did you say spin? Spin zero spheroidal harmonics. It's not the same because of this term. Okay? They appear in a lot of uh, things in physics. Actually, Wolfram now has the S zero. I mean, there, you, you, you get similar stuff for S1 and S2. Wolfram now coded this equation for S0. So there's a, you can call spheroidal harmonic for spin zero fields. Very good. So this is obviously now, if omega is real, if you're just throwing stuff in a standard stern uville problem, you can solve it use, using the usual tools. Let me look at the radial equation. So if you try to understand the behavior at the horizon, the horizon, by the way, are roots of this delta, okay? You do a standard local analysis, Frobenius analysis, so you search for a parameter beta, okay? And you find that beta is plus or minus i, r plus squared plus a squared, omega minus am over r plus minus r minus. This when r goes to r plus, okay? At infinity, your wave function r behaves as one over r, a in, so it's a, an ingoing component plus an outgoing component, the usual stuff. So the only difference with respect to non-spinning black holes really is the horizon dependence. And you see that now, 
because of the spin, it's not really a standard ingoing wave with kind of an easy dependence. Very good, so we can try to repeat exactly what we did for Schwarzschild, which is using the Ron scan of two independent solutions and see if there's energy conservation, right? Now, this time, you see, there's a term that has first derivatives. So we can't really say, oh, the Ron scan is constant, but we know. It's Abel's formula that tells us that the Ron scan omega, so for a function of this type, P y prime plus Q y equals zero, then the Ronskin between two solutions is some constant times this, right? Since P is not zero, okay, it's not a constant, but I know how it, how it uh, changes. So I'm going to take the solution, the complex conjugate of this guy, so psi one goes like this, R minus R plus minus I gamma, and 1 over r, a in, e to the minus i omega r, plus a out, e to the plus i omega r, where gamma is this guy, r plus squared plus a squared over r plus minus r minus omega minus m capital omega. Okay? You'll find the following. You'll find that the Ronskin times the delta function, this guy, has to be a constant. Let me call it K0. This comes from Abel's formula, this one, okay? Now you can evaluate the Ronskin close to the horizon, close to infinity, and match them using this behavior. And you'll find the following. At the horizon, the Ronskin is this, 2i gamma over r minus r plus. At infinity, the Ronskin is 2i omega over r squared a in squared minus a out squared. If you match using this formula, then you'll find the following. a in minus a out has to be equal to r plus squared plus a squared over omega, omega minus m capital omega. Okay? So this is the final result we wanted. Now if you look at the, uh, what exactly a in and a out are, well, they're just the ingoing piece, the thing that you threw in, okay, when you were far away from the black hole and the thing that comes out and that you measure when you're far away from the black hole, okay? So what this tells you is that if you're throwing sufficiently low frequency waves, this is a wave, a scalar wave, you can do it for vectors and whatnot, what not, okay? If omega, if small omega is smaller than the, angular than the angular velocity of your black hole, then this guy is negative, and this means that A in has to be smaller than A out, okay? So super radiance, if omega smaller than M omega, okay? But if you think about it, this, this small omega really is the analog of the uh, angular velocity of the moon, right? So this is kind of a nice way to think about this. You, you're sending in a wave, which is rotating, I mean, omega is basically the angular velocity of the wave. So it is rotating slower than, than, than the black hole, right? So it's extracting this rotational energy away from the black hole, which, is, which would be the Earth in the, in, the, in the slide, right? This doesn't tell you how much A in and A out are. You can compute it numerically. It's in the notebook again. And the values look like this, okay? So, so for scalar waves, the, this curve here, the black curve are numerical results, okay? Dashed lines are some low frequency approximation to the, to the numerics. The maximum amplification factor, so Z, is really not very encouraging. For scalar waves, 
we, you get a, around 0.4% extra. It's not that much, right? For a vector, you get up to 4% if you fine-tune the frequency of the wave that you send in. For tensors, the, the thing is amazing. If you fine-tune the frequency of, the, of your gravitational wave, you get back 147% more than you sent in. So it's a generous energy extraction. Okay, this was all done for massless fields, okay? So you might ask, okay, that's fine. I send in a wave, the wave gets, gets amplified. It's funny, I mean, it's not really that important, right? So you don't need to tune it, but I'm just saying the amplification factors. So this is always, this always gives you super radiance if omega is small. But the question is, how big is super radiance? But so if you look at the here, for instance, uh, the gravitational case, okay? If omega, so this has a black hole spinning at close to the maximum possible value, right? If the frequency is too low, Z is still positive. So there's still super radiance. But now you're talking about 10 to minus 3%. So that's nothing. But if you fine tune up to this point, then we're talking about something interesting, right? Okay. Okay, but so the interesting thing is that this has huge applications, uh, well, or at least very, very interesting applications. I will discuss dark matter physics, but there's others. For example, actually the root of all these applications is not connected to superradiant itself or only, but you need to add an extra ingredient. The, the ingredient is very simple. If you have this system, it's spinning, it amplifies waves. Now, if you try to enclose the system, so you have a spinning black hole, okay? Now, if you trap the system in a cavity, what is going to happen? Well, you throw in a wave, Right? You expect this wave to be amplified, so you get something more out. But then it's trapped, right? So it has to fall back again. It reflects here, falls back in, gets amplified, and so on and so forth. So this is, again, an exponential cascade, and this is known as the black hole bomb. There are space times like ADS that actually give you this mirror for free. So any spinning black hole in ADS, or at least most of them, should be unstable against this mechanism. So it's an interesting thing. In ADS, that's a good question. In flat space we know, I think, in ADS, so, so the angular momentum should be transferred to a cloud, so if, if this is a gravitational process, any small fluctuation of order epsilon here, it's going to extract the angular momentum until the process stops. The process stops when this condition is verified, right? So at the end, what you should be getting is some sort of cloud of gravitons outside the black hole geometry, right? So you extracted the angular momentum and it was deposited in a moon outside in a way that the moon and the black hole always have the same face, right? They, they are co-rotating. Um, having said this, it's, I don't think we know for sure if the process is fully stationary in ADS. There are reasons to suspect that this cloud is actually also unstable at the nonlinear level. There, are, there was a simulation a few months ago that seems to see this. So the, there is no truly stationary state for this instability. It's just going to break up in smaller and smaller pieces. But I don't think we have a definite answer. In the flat case, it's somewhat simpler, and I'm going to discuss that. OK, so I started, I think, the discussion two days ago by saying that one of the reasons why we're interested in black hole physics is because, well, one of the big open problems, which is dark matter, we only have access to it through the gravitational channel. So it kind of makes sense that we try to understand first gravity a lot better than, than we do right now, right? There's 
some solutions that don't require super radiance for that, for example, maybe dark matter all is all under the form of black holes, mini black holes, primordial black holes that were generated in the universe. They are hard to see nowadays. It's one possibility. Another possibility that does, also doesn't use super radiance uses the in spiral. If you have dark matter in the universe and now you're merging two black holes or two neutron stars, right? They are merging in an environment which is not empty. So two things are going to happen. First, these black holes accrete the dark matter that they find in their path, right? They are following dark matter, they're accreting. But when they do this, they're also dragging behind all of the dark matter that they see, right? They are pulling, they need to pull all of the dark matter they see. They, this is called gravitational drag. So there's two effects, and the two effects basically contribute in the same way. They make the spiral proceed faster, right? So one way you have to check if dark matter is present in kind of significant uh, quantities is by trying to match the way the spiral proceeds with that of a black hole in vacuum. If it doesn't fit well, maybe some non-trivial density of, of dark matter will do the job. It's different from friend dragging. Yeah, friend dragging just means that things have to follow what the black hole is doing. Gravitational drag, um, uh, gravitational drag, uh, well, it's gravitational drag. So if, if you think about my gravitational field, if I'm standing still, it attracts all the molecules in this room in equal way, right? But if I'm moving, right, now you're going to think, well, these guys behind me are pulled so these guys behind me, I, I'm going to create a wake in the density of guys behind me. The guys in front, of course, still don't know that I'm moving. The guys behind me do. You create a density disturbance, and that density disturbance produces its own gravitational field, and that's pulling me back. So it's a non-spherically symmetric disturbance. Okay? It's called gravitational drag. It's really just drag. Very good. Okay, but I'm going to discuss superradiance and for a reason, okay? The reason is that many dark matter candidates interact very, very weakly with the standard model fields, okay? Very weakly indeed. So this is a plot, well, this is an exclusion plot. Don't ask me about the experiment. I have no idea what they are, or at least most of them, <laughs> okay? But this shows what happens if dark matter comes under the form of a scalar, actually an axion, that couples to the Maxwell field, so this is the coupling strength, as a function of the, scale, the mass of the scalar, okay? And the units here are 10 to the minus 5 electron volt here, 10 to the minus 15, okay? And here, the same thing for a vector field, some hidden uh, vector sector, couples to the Maxwell field again, this is the strength of the coupling. I mean, if there's no coupling, there's no way to see it, right? at least non-gravitationally. So there is a coupling and as, a, as a function of the mass. And these are exclusion plots. And there's one thing that you notice immediately. We can only, using standard model physics, we, you can only constrain stuff that you see, right? So at zero coupling, it's impossible to constrain whatever, right? Okay? So I, I'm, I'm going to try to convince you now that black holes are the ideal tool to see things that are impossible to see otherwise, right? So even if the coupling to standard model is zero, the equivalence principle of GR tells you that even dark matter falls in the same way as everything else. And we're going to use this property to try to see the unseen, okay? So basically, I'm, I'm going to try and constrain using black hole superradiance, zero coupling to matter in mass ranges from 10 to minus 9 to 10 to minus 20 electron volt. Okay, so I'm going to only assume, you can be uh, more complicated, but I'm only going to assume the following. Dark matter looks something like either a massive scalar, a massive vector, a massive tensor, whatever you want. Okay, it has to be a boson, it has to have some mass term which is sufficiently small. Why 
Why am I doing this? Well, because the idea is to use the black hole bomb again. Okay? I don't need a mirror because the mass term of the scalar field, actually, this is obvious from this equation. Okay? This A tilde is the separation constant plus mu squared r squared. If you look at the asymptotic solutions, oh, this solution, by the way, is for massless fields. If you do this solution for massive fields, this omega is replaced by this, okay, for massive fields. So you see that if the, the, if the field has a sufficiently low energy, it can't propagate. The square root picks up an eye, right? And you either get exponential damping or you get exponential growth, and that's irregular. So in practice, the mass term works as this mirror, okay? So you, you give a kick in a scalar field close to a black hole, it gets amplified in the ergo region, tries to escape, but it can't because it's massive. It needs to fall back. Well, it's going to get amplified there, so you get an instability. I'm not working out the details of the instability, but you can. It's a very easy exercise to solve this equation when omega is sufficiently small. You solve it close to the horizon, close to infinity, you do matched asymptotic expansions, and you get the result. The result is this one, okay? The time scale, so to summarize, massive scalars around the spinning black hole trigger an instability, and the time scale is this one. You could think, well, this process has to be completely negligible. It's a tiny field. It's a supermassive guy. How, how are we even discussing this, right? Well, we're discussing this because the time scale for a supermassive black hole and the field of 10 to minus 16 electron volt is 100 seconds. I mean, can you believe this? <laughs> it's 100 seconds, right? The reason, of course, so, so it has a strong dependence on the mass, right? So as soon as you get away from an ideal mass, you see there's a power nine here. So the time scale grows immensely if you, if you make the mass smaller, okay? And actually, if the tuning to the ideal time scale happens when the Compton wavelength of this field is roughly of the order of the Schwarzschild radius of your black hole, okay? So then you have the largest coupling between the field and, and the black hole. So it's 100 seconds. It's going to do stuff to our universe, okay? It's going to do things. If you actually try to simulate this, this was done by my student, Halvi Vitek, a few years back. For a vector field, it looks something like this. This is an almost maximally spinning black hole, and we threw in a vector field with some mass term. I don't remember which one, okay? This is how it looks like. It's a, a dipole mode. So the, the, the stuff that grows outside the black hole has to be non-axisymmetric, okay? Always. If you think about the Earth-Moon system, th if the moon was a, a ring, the effect would not exist, right? You need some non-symmetry. You need dissipation and so on, right? So whatever you grow here has to be non-axisymmetric. So the instability gives rise to a non-axisymmetric mode. This is an L1, M1 mode, okay? The final state, we didn't evolve past the final state, this is a real vector field, so Maxwell, except that we added a small mass term, okay? Will and East did something uh, slightly different. Because they wanted to actually understand the final state, they kind of cheated a little bit, so they added, they considered the black hole, and now a complex vector field. So it's not real universe, it's complex, but the advantage of doing a complex field is that the stress tensor can be completely stationary. Okay? Even if the field oscillates, the stress tensor can combine in a way that it's truly stationary. So what they get is something like this. They start with a, with a cloud around the black hole of very small amplitude. The black hole is spinning. It doesn't look like it. The cloud is extracting angular momentum. It doesn't look like it because it's a complex vector field. So the stress tensor, again, is time independent and, in fact, is spherically symmetric. Okay? And the cloud just grows. So the final state is a truly hairy black hole solution, okay? Stationary black hole solution. It's a spinning black hole surrounded by a co-rotating cloud of 
vector fields. Okay, but now back to our universe, back to real fields generating non-axisymmetric clouds. So question, what is going to happen? How is the system going to evolve? Can we use the evolution to do some science or not? So for that, you need to evolve the system, okay? So take a spinning buckle, take a cloud that's growing via superradiance, take an accretion disk that's releasing stuff into the buckle, and just evolve this, okay? This is one example of what can happen. You start with a buckle that's 10 to the 4 solar masses, okay? And the field, you admit the existence of a field which is 10 to the minus 18 electron volt. Very light field, okay? The instability is really weak, okay? It's weak because the mass coupling is only 10 to the minus 4, okay? It's very small, super radiance is irrelevant. But there's accretion. So you start with a black hole, so this is spinning at half the maximum possible value. Accretion means that the mass, so this is time, and I think this is, oh, this is uh, dimensional spin, okay? So as time goes by, the mass increases, the guy is eating stuff, it's eating stuff that's co-rotating, so the spin increases. The spin becomes nearly maximal. The mass is still increasing, which means that this coupling is also increasing. When the coupling become, becomes of order one, the time scales become of order a minute, okay? Then the instability kicks in. The black hole loses mass almost instantaneously, okay? It loses spin, and then super radiance controls everything, okay? It's still accreting, but super radiance to cold. So the evolution is governed by accretion locked onto super radiance. And then you see the black hole follows this line here, okay? In the Raji plane, black hole mass versus angular momentum, after some time, the black hole does this, okay? Of course, if you start with a black hole which is initially more massive, then super radiance kicks in earlier because the coupling is larger. That's it. This is one black hole. If you spread black holes in your universe, you can follow the trajectories, okay? And you're going to find something that I know you already thought of, which is there's some ranges, some part of parameter space where black holes can't exist because they will be unstable. They lose mass and spin very quickly, okay? You see, we spread randomly 10 to the cube black holes random spin and mass distributions, you evolve them after a Hubble time scale, and you find this. This is for different uh, accretion efficiencies, okay? After 10 to the 8 years or 10 to the 9, if you look at your black holes in the universe, you will find there shouldn't be any in some parts of parameter space, okay? So now you can think, okay, so the only thing I need to do is observe black holes, measure their mass, their spin, and if they happen to lie here, this means the field cannot exist. This is the idea, right? Because, I mean, they would just be unstable there, okay? So if you play this game for vectors, you get something like this window here, okay? So, for instance, if you admit that there's a vector field of mass 10 to minus 18, in this blue curve here, here, all black holes in the universe should be unstable on time scales of a thousand years or less. You should not be seeing any, okay? And yet, a catalog of black holes, these are these crosses here, the size of the cross means observational error, tells you they exist. So, this guy is ruled out, okay? If you trust the measurements. And now you also understand that the way to constrain lighter and lighter fields is by picking up more and more massive black holes. The more massive, the, the, the massiver black hole we knew at the time was this guy here called Feral 9. If you talk to the persons who did the study, they will tell you they don't trust the measurement errors, okay? But if we trust them, the black hole has a mass of roughly 10 to the 9 solar masses. This means these guys will be excluding a vector field with a mass 10 to minus 20 electron volt. If you look in the particle data group booklet, you will see that accelerator bounds are 10 to minus 18. Okay, so you can use black holes to improve on the CERN physics. Kind of amazing, okay? Of course, I'm sweeping under the floor things. Things meaning 
these evolutions never take into account the coupling of the vector field, for instance, with the accretion disks, right? I don't know if this vector field is interacting a lot with the accretion disk. I know if, th that if I have a massive graviton, the coupling is negligible. So for gravitons, in fact, this bound is now on the particle data booklet. 10 to the minus 23 electron volts just from superradiance of massive vectors. Let me, do I have five minutes? Okay, do I still have five minutes? Oh, well, five, okay, then I have plenty of time, great. But I thought I was really running out, but, but that's fantastic. So these are measurements using electromagnetic data, okay? But the cloud is non-axisymmetric. So you're generating stuff that's spinning, co-rotating with the black hole, but it's non-axisymmetric. What this does is generate a non-zero, time-varying quadrupole moment. And if you go at Stas' uh, lectures, you'll see that a non-zero quadrupole moment that varies in time has to emit gravitational waves, okay? Here, so what you measure are these guys. So you measure black hole spin, J over M squared, and mass. How do you measure this? Okay, is that, is that the question? Okay, mass is easy to measure. You just look at motion of things nearby. Spin is a lot difficult, a lot more difficult. I think that's why the <laughs> I was in Paris giving a talk last week, and the author of this, guy, of this point here told me, we don't trust that number. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> the way you measure spin, you measure it in two different ways. The first is, so you, I told you that black holes are surrounded by accretion disks, and that the accretion disk cuts off at some point, called, which I call the ISCO, the last point where circular orbits are possible, right? So if you look at the accretion disks, you should always see, and, and radiation from the accretion disks, you should always see a maximum frequency in the problem, and corresponds to the ISCO. Now, the, ISCO, the location of the ISCO depends on the black hole spin. If you spin this guy up, the ISCO is moving inwards, okay? So one of the ways to do this is to measure uh, brightness distribution across the accretion disk and try to match it to some modeling that you have for curved black holes in GR, okay? This will be the continuum feeding method, okay? It's not entirely trivial. There's a lot of parameters going in there, and I'm not going to say I don't trust it, but it's, I mean, it's too complicated for me, okay? The second method actually seems nicer because you only look at spectral lines, okay? You look at iron K alpha line. It's, well, it's one of the spectral lines. And an interesting feature of those lines, which basically amounts to what I said about the way that black holes look like, is that spectral lines look, go, get distorted. Depending on where you measure them, they get Doppler shifts because the atoms are moving, they get gravitational redshift because they're in a the potential well, and so on, right? So spectral lines, a line that would be looking like this, can look like, so if you add spin to it, can look something like this, right? So people fit the spectral lines in accretion disks to what you expect from GR. So you have two independ completely independent measurements. Most of the times they give numbers which don't agree at all, okay? There are, I think now there's an effort to bring these guys together. I think they started getting measurements that agree. It's still a tricky business, but this is how they do it, okay? It can only improve in the future, at least, right? Okay. But so this cloud is non axisymmetric it's emitting gravitational waves, so one of the ways that you have of testing for the presence of fields in, uh, around black holes is to actually just go to LIGO and see if there's non-trivial sources of waves there, right? Now, the cloud, this cloud that develops around the spinning black hole is at most 10% of the black hole mass, okay? You cannot use the quadrupole formula to estimate gravitational radiation because the fields are incoherent. So that's something we learned 
when we were trying to do this. So the way to actually compute gravitational radiation is exactly the way that we computed gravitational radiation from point particles here or from scalar fields and so on, right? You expand the Einstein field equations, but the right-hand side corresponds, corresponds to the stress tensor of this cloud. This is how it's done, okay? But you will find that the emission is basically monochromatic, okay? It, this system emits waves at a frequency which is roughly twice the orbital frequency, the, the angular frequency of the black hole, which is the orbital frequency of the cloud, right? So as Imina, Arvanitaki, and other people did this very interesting study. They looked at, at the waves that would come out of the system and they estimated how much event, number of, the number of events that LIGO would see per year. And this is the number. If there is, because, so, so let me, wait, let me go back. There's an important point here. If there is a field somewhere, if there's a field, a fundamental field with a mass 10 to the minus 12 electron volt, for example, okay, you don't need to have the field present close to the black hole, okay? There, you don't need to have any abundance of the field anywhere in the universe. Any small quantum fluctuation of that field is going to grow exponentially. Anything is going to trigger the instability, okay? This means that any, any black hole in the universe eventually would be unstable against this mechanism. You don't need to be finding another black hole to merge it with. You just need to have a single spinning black hole. Eventually, it will get there, right? So you should be seeing a lot of stuff. And in fact, their estimate is up to 10 to the 5 events per year in LIGO if there is a mass, if there is a field, a scalar, with a mass of 10 to minus 13 or so, okay? Just because there's so many stellar mass black holes out there. For LISA, so you need a lot of more massive black holes. We, actually, the, the, the distribution is kind of uncertain, but they estimate that we would see, so these, these are individual resolvable events from each of these guys, okay? They estimate they would see around up to one event per year with LISA. Now we're talking about masses of 10 to minus 17 electron volt coming from 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. But if you think that any black hole in the universe history was subjected to this kind of mechanism, you could think, oh, wait a minute. The universe should be completely filled with radiation from these guys. So you could, lose, you could look for stochastic backgrounds cross-correlating different arms of your, of your detector. So we did this exercise few months back, and what we found was this. So this would be, so this is the, uh, the density in gravitational waves, the primordial density across different frequencies. This black line is what LIGO, is actually what LISA is supposed to be measuring when it goes up, okay? Here, it's the same for LIGO. This is the first run. This will be advanced LIGO, okay? If a field with mass 10 to the minus 17 electron volt exists, it will generate this density in waves, okay? Clearly, clearly above the LISA threshold. So it should be filling the universe with waves of frequency 10 to the minus 3 hertz, and we should be seeing them in detectors, okay? If a field of a mass 10 to the minus 12 electron volt exists, it can't exist because even the first run of LIGO ruled it out. It's a very small window. I mean, sorry, this is a very small constraint, okay? Uh, but still, it ruled out exactly 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 12.1. But the, the other runs are going to constrain a larger window, right? So this is fantastic. We look for stochastic backgrounds in frequency of 10 to 100 hertz. If we don't find it, you're really ruling out fundamental fields that might exist, scalars, vectors, tensors, whatever. So, I, uh, it, it, yeah? You could, if the curve is similar enough, you could confuse it with others. Since we haven't seen anything yet, that, these are ruled out anyway. But yeah, there's a danger. This is a very specific profile, right? It's monochromatic, it's a, the power law of density. We know it very well. It's different from white dwarf, white dwarf. So it's different from most of the sources we know of. So, 
Very good. And of course, now you can ask, what about stars? If Buckles do this wonderful job, can stars do the same? And the answer is, I have no idea. Well, you need couplings. You always need coupling. You remember the Earth Moon, right? You need the ocean to have some kind of interaction with the crust. So if you throw, say, an electromagnetic wave towards a rotating star, if the star doesn't see the, the field, it cannot, I mean, the, there's nothing there. There's no interaction, right? So you need to do some coupling, OK? Back in sign, uh, 10 or, well, I don't know, 15 years ago, in 93, I think, 98, my god. In 98, actually showed the following. If you have, so, it's, so he was trying to basically uh, tell people to go to the lab and show that rotational superradiance exists, OK? So he showed the following. If you have a spinning cylinder made of some conducting material with some conductivity epsilon, OK? If you throw in, so you spin the cylinder, it's in this room, you spin the cylinder, it's spinning with an angular frequency, capital omega. If you send in waves away from this lamp, not exactly the same, it has to be low frequency. But if the frequency of the wave that you send in, light, is smaller than this, then superradiance occurs. You're going to extract energy away from the rotating cylinder. Okay? Of course, he does this because there's some conductivity. Oh, the, the symbol usually is sigma. Okay? Because there's conductivity, there's an interaction between the cylinder material and the light. Okay? So it's a very nice kind of setup. Nobody went to the lab, as far as I know, to try to see this. He even told people, look, if you, surround, if you close this in a box, you're going to get an instability. So that might be easier to detect. Nobody went to the lab. What, what they did eventually last year in Nottingham was to go to the lab with water. They made water spin up, and, and they saw superators in that way with sound waves. But anyway, this tells you that if you are able to couple a star with light, then you're going to get super radiance. You can do this. I mean, stars have some conductivity. Neutron stars, for instance, have a conductivity. It's really large, OK? And that's unfortunate. They conduct very well. Uh, but still, if you work out the details, which are not very well worked out, even though it's my work, we can't control rapidly spinning stars, OK? But you will find that this mechanism does exactly the same. If you have a massive field, around the star that has a conductivity for that kind of field, the field interacts with the star, extracts a bit of energy. It's massive, so it can't propagate, goes back, extracts a bit of energy, right? So stars are going to spin down. The wonderful thing about neutron stars is that some of them are pulsars. And pulsars, the period of pulsars, are known to a very, 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 very good precision. So any spin down, you're going to see it, right? So you can impose constraints. They're, they are what they are. I don't think they are ultra interesting. I hope nobody's taping this. But still, if you plot the conductivity versus mass plane, these are the constraints that you can put, that you can put for different pulsars. These are here, OK? So in this range of conductivity versus mass, these guys would spin down in a way that you would see them. And we, we don't sp see them spinning down, OK, to that rate. So it's kind of interesting. There's other things that I swept. I always like to give the stuff that we don't know. And I think, unfortunately, we don't know most of the things, OK? So these fields, mostly these scalars that I've been talking, they were introduced mostly as pseudoscalars, right? And th there should be some, some coupling to standard model fields. I've been neglecting them, OK? If you don't neglect them, one possible coupling goes like this, right? So you have the field, you have the mass term, super radiance here, instability here, cloud here, that's good. But what happens if you look at this guy? Well, now you have a field that's growing, but who knows if it's really growing? Because it's talking to a massless field. So the energy that it extracts from the black hole could simply be transferred via this coupling to, to Maxwell, and Maxwell goes away, and that's it. No cloud, no nothing, right? 
for most of the couplings we know of, these guys are small enough that this effect is small. But a few months ago, actually it came out last week on PRL, these guys here conjecture that, well, they have some calculation, not very, uh, well, not yet all the things that you would expect, but they conjecture that what's going to happen when the coupling is taken into account is the following. These guys make the cloud grow, so spinning black hole, cloud growing, growing, growing. Then at some point, this guy, because you see, what matters is k-axion times the magnitude of the scalar. This guy becomes large enough, and you're basically going to trigger a blast of electromagnetic waves. Suddenly, this goes over a critical threshold, and you get an explosion in electromagnetic waves. They call these blasts. I don't know the acronym, what it stands for, but anyway, it looks nice. Uh, they also conjecture that it only happens for black hole masses smaller than 10 to the minus 2 solar masses. So this can only apply for primor primordial black holes, but we need urgently a real calculation of this. Okay? They have estimates, but that's really all there is to it. I think I'm going to skip this. The other open questions, so these are open questions that I had 1.5 years ago. Some of them, I think, are being resolved, but I think many of them will stay with us for years. The first is, can we measure rotational superradiance? I was giving this talk in Nottingham, I think 1.5, well, maybe more, years ago, and fortunately for me, those guys closed the subject. We did measure it in the lab on Earth. That's good. If you work out superradiance, it comes in all bunches of forms. Charged black holes have superradiance against charged scalar fields. Spinning, uh, water that's spinning in your bathtub has superradiance against sound waves. Okay? I think Bill Unruh conjectures that cyclones also have superradiance playing a role there. If you work out the maximum amplification factor for any of the systems we know, something funny seems to happen. Okay? For massless fields, the amplification factor is at most 140%. For charged fields, it's exactly bounded by 100%. For acoustic black holes, it's ex bounded by exactly 100%. Okay? And for every case that I looked at, I could never get amplification factors. So I send in a wave of one. I never get more than two back. Okay? Maybe this is just a coincidence, or maybe there's something deeper at work that I have no idea what it is. But I thought it would be nice to, to live this year. So it's an open issue for me. Another open issue, very important, that we need to understand, I think, urgently in the next decades, are black hole binaries. We know that a single black hole has ergo regions. We, have, we don't even know how to define an ergo region when we have dynamical space times. We're this lousy, right? Of course, you could take a numerical relativity simulation, throw in grenades, let them explode, and measure the outgoing particles. This has not been done, but I think somebody should take one year of their life to do this, because it's really interesting. Do black hole binaries give rise to superradiance or not? We have no idea. I mean, the numerical relativity simulations you find out there, even the best ones, evolve up to 20, 50, the best one, 100 orbits. This is nothing, right? The universe will produce 100,000, millions of orbits that we're going to see in the detectors. The time scales are completely different. We have no idea of what happens on these huge time scales. The end state of superadiative stability, somebody asked. The end state, of course, is always a slower spinning black hole in asymptotically flat space times, if your field is real, just because gravitational waves exist, they give rise to the no air theorems. Okay, so they, they basically work to spin down everything we know. The universe really hates relative motion. In ADS, in, in space times which are slightly different, we, we don't, I don't think we know. Okay? Still, nobody evolved fully numerically a superradiant instability in flat space time. Taking a simulation, putting a black hole there, triggering a scalar field or a vector field, letting it go, see the cloud grow, see gravitational emission, and so on. 
All of this has been done at perturbative level using exactly the tools we discussed in these four lectures. Okay, this is all there is. We think it's accurate enough, but who knows? It's usually stated that superradiance is the exact wave analog of the Penrose process. But the Penrose process was done, if you remember, with grenades. We throw a particle in, it separates, and that's it. But these guys are made of fermions, okay? Fermions have no superradiance. Just because of Pauli exclusion principle, you can't really have two guys occupying the same state. So if you throw in a, a fermion into a spinning black hole, you're not going to get energy extraction, okay? So one of the puzzles is how come the Penrose process works for fermions, and it's supposed to be the analog of the superradiance, which only works for, for bosons. How can, he, you know, how can you kind of make sense of this? There was some partial progress by a student of mine, but I don't think this is nearly finished, really. And finally, this is a key question. It will maybe take years, maybe it takes weeks. I have no idea. We need a good idea. We need somebody to, to sit down and work out what happens to superradiance when you have real universe, when you have a Christian disk, when you have magnetic fields and it couples to your, to your boson. Finally, before finishing, let me tell you another thing that happens. So this is, this is an example that I did to show you what's superradiance. By the way, superradiance was known by Klein in the 20s, 1920s, okay? This was done, he was trying to investigate what happens to fermions when you scatter them off a potential barrier, like this one. This can be our effective potential in vacuum space times, okay? If you scatter a charged field, so this is the equation of motion, okay? You will find that exactly the same thing happens. You throw in a wave, let, let the guy bounce back. Throw in a wave, a fraction goes here, it has negative energy, so this guy was amplified at the expense of a negative energy inside the barrier, okay? Exactly the same thing happens for a black hole. The potential looks slightly different, it's not constant, they're exactly the same, okay? And you can see that because there is an horizon here, this way, the negative energy state just keeps, keeps on going. So, we don't care about it. But now you can think, ah, wait a minute, let me try to connect to what he was saying in the morning. If there is no horizon, right, I told you already that this guy has to bounce back. So this is what happens. I throw in the wave packet, but now there's something here. So it has to come back. It interacts with the, with the border, and you see it creates a new, a new pulse, creates a new pulse. The negative energy state is growing. Therefore, this pulse is also growing, and you see what you're doing, right? You're basically just triggering an instability because there's no horizon to dump the negative energy states into. So very nice. You can actually use this, and a lot of ignorance, to, to constrain potential objects which do not have horizons. So if you admit, it's a huge assumption, okay? But if you admit that the compact objects out there have an exterior metric that's curved, but cut off at some radius, okay, you can work out the details of this instability. And again, if all of the objects in the universe if none of the objects in the universe are vehicles, this is going to give you a huge stochastic background. Actually, let me see. Yeah, this, this is a stochastic background. It's huge. So if basically the non-measurement of any stochastic background in gravitational wave detectors rules out all of these models. Anything that looks like her in the outside but does not have an horizon would be ruled out, okay? This is an example where, let me see what I have. Oh, yeah. So I'm placing, I'm taking a curved geometry and I'm cutting it off at the radius R, which is the horizon, one plus epsilon, and epsilon is 10 to minus 40. Okay? Right? If, so this is a conservative number, by the way. If epsilon, I will explain why in a minute. 10 to minus 40, this line here would basically, you see, this would be the level of the background that you'd get. Advanced LIGO design would see all of this, all of this. So no object, even with an epsilon of 10 to minus 40, could exist in the universe under this assumption, okay? 
If you make epsilon even smaller, you could think, oh, wait a minute, I can go around this. If epsilon is really, really small, you look at the way the wave go. So let, let, no, wait. Look at this. If epsilon is really small, it means that this wall is going to the left. So if it really goes to the left, then the wave takes a lot of time to get there, and the, time, the instability time scale will become larger. So you think, okay, I can get around this if epsilon is really small, okay? The problem with that is that the time scale, the light, if you follow light rays, we did this exercise in the first class, the time, scale, the time that light takes to hit a barrier goes like log of epsilon, okay? So even if you make epsilon 10 to minus 100, which is a minute number, it's going to change this by a factor two, right? So it doesn't really, really help you. Uh, of course, you can also argue, well, wait a minute. If there's viscosity somewhere in the problem, that might kill the instability. That's true. I don't think we know anything about absorption, and so I'm not even going to mention that. So in the assumption that the exterior metric is curved and nothing else happens, there's no funny business going on inside the star, then you rule out basically everything by the non-observation of gravitational wave backgrounds. So let me finish this talk and my set of lectures by, by trying to convey the message that really these are exciting times for me, but mostly for you. For people who are starting the PhD or young postdocs, these are really unique times. I started my PhD as a crackpot. <laughs> Somebody going around looking at gravitational waves, giving talks, oh, what the guy is saying again, man? We've been looking for waves for 20 years, 50 years. They don't exist. We'll never see them. These detectors cannot see stuff that moves on 10 to minus 21 scales, right? So I think you're in a much better position that at least we saw them. It's the time to understand what they're telling us. And we have no idea. I mean, this, you know, I think sometimes I sound way more excited than I should be, but that's, these are just a couple of things that we thought about in the last two years. There's really a lot of stuff to be found out, a lot of stuff to be done. So thank you and enjoy the meeting.